Once again, now a fourth time together uh, to Psalm 139, Psalm 139, and as I've done each time, I've read the preceding context. This time that means reading the psalm in its entirety, Uh, and so let's do that again together. Psalm 139, this is the holy and the inspired Word of God. Let us give it our sincere and full attention. For the choir director, a psalm of David. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. Where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in shale, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you and the night is as bright as the day, darkness and light are alike to you. For you form my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me when as yet there was not one of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand when I awake I am still with you. Now to the, cons- the text we'll consider this evening. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, men of bloodshed, for they speak against you wickedly, and your enemies take your name in vain. Do not I hate those who hate you, O Lord, and do not I loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with the utmost hatred. They have become my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there be any hurtful way in me, and lead me in the everlasting way. Let's ask the Lord to illumine us as we look into this passage. Our God in heaven, we do pray that you would grant us now the the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of illumination, that he who is our teacher would come near to us even in this moment and instruct us in the meaning of this Scripture, Lord, that that same Spirit would seal these words to our hearts, that we might Hide them, Lord, we pray the Spirit would write these truths on our hearts and make them even our very own through His ministry. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. As we proceed to the final section of the psalm that we've been considering in the previous three sermons, we're struck, perhaps, in verse 19 by what seems like a, a stark change in tone and subject matter. Thus far, the psalmist has been speaking of God's perfect knowledge, of His perfect presence, of His perfect power, and now, and he's been responding, interspersed along the way with with doxologies and praise and adoration, and now he breaks forth in a proclamation of hatred. And it might strike us uh, at first glance, upon first reading, that this is a a radical shift from the transcendence of verses 1 uh, through 18 to the intense resolve of hatred in verses 19 to 22. In fact, some liberal scholars have suggested that this must have been added by some editor later on, although I submit that That seems like an odd thing to add. Uh, You don't normally add things that seem to be jarring. You add things in order to smooth out uh, a subject. There's, of course, no textual evidence or reason to think that this was added to the psalm later on, but that David wrote this to hold together as a single piece with the meditation that he's been giving us under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. While this section of the psalm, particularly verses 19 through 22, may seem radically out of step with the tone of what's gone before it, I submit that, in fact, it does fit very naturally. So what are we to make of this intense interjection? He's been talking about God's knowledge and power and presence with regard to himself, 
But now David, for a moment here, looks out of himself and he considers others who are walking in wickedness. This provides a, a realistic flavor to the psalm as David resolves himself based on what he has been contemplating. And I submit that this resolution, particularly in verses 19 to 22, but also the resolution uh, in the last two verses of the psalm, are in fact a proper and a fitting response to everything that's gone to this point. He moves in the final section of the psalm from what we might call contemplation and adoration to resolution. And that this resolution follows in a way that syncs up with what's gone before it. Doctrine, as we've already seen in the instances of doxology that have sprung up, should always lead to commitment. And here we hear a twofold resolution on the part of the psalmist. I've entitled the sermon, Aligning with God. And this alignment of his heart is, in fact, the proper and the fitting response to the things he's been saying about God all along up until this point. So for this evening, I want to take only two points for an outline of consideration. It's a five-verse section. It falls out very nicely into two conceptual units. And so I want to consider first that, that the Christian aligns himself with God. The Christian aligns himself with God, verses 19 through 22. And then secondly, we'll consider that the Christian desires to be known by God, verses 23 and 24. He aligns himself with God. He desires to be known by God. First then, with regard to this alignment, we, we can see this in David's emphatic statement of dissociation from the wicked. He says, again, Oh, that you would slay the wicked. Depart from me, therefore, men of bloodshed. It's interesting. The second line there, while it's still the psalm, and the first line he's praying to God, Oh, that you would slay the wicked. The second line is actually addressed to the wicked themselves. Sometimes we find this in the psalms. Sometimes the psalmist is addressed, addressing himself to God. There are times in the psalms when the psalmist address themselves to holy angels. We do that in some of our own hymnody. Angels help us to adore him. Ye behold him face to face. We sometimes in our doxology exhort those around us to praise, even as we ourselves praise, here is an instance in which he not only prays to God, but he speaks to the wicked. And what he says to the wicked is, depart from me, you men of bloodshed. Depart. He asks God to slay them, and he says to them, depart from me. There is a certain sense in which doctrine does divide. And what I mean by that is not in the sense in which we have different Christian denominations um, or disagreements on secondary issues. Um, there's a place in which brothers in the Lord can hold those disagreements um, in peace and with integrity. I don't mean it in that respect, but that doctrine, the truth about God and the truth about His glory and the truth about salvation and His Son does in fact draw a sword very decisively between the righteous and the wicked. Jesus said in Matthew's Gospel, Do not think I came to bring peace upon the earth, but I came to bring a sword. And he says that he came to bring the sword even to man's own household, to divide parents and children so that an enemy, a man's enemies will be those of his own household. That's the effect of the Gospel. The Gospel divides people. The gospel takes from a mass of people on the road to destruction, and it pulls them off of that road to destruction, and it removes them from that course of darkness, and it removes them from that way of bloodshed and of deceit, and it places them on a new path. There is a sense in which there's a division that is the necessary consequence of God's righteousness when there are unholy persons, angelic or human, that are arrayed against God and against His anointed. Doctrine divides those who love God from those who oppose Him. As David has found his heart drawn to God in all his greatness throughout the first 18 verses, he is consequently repulsed by everything that is opposed to God. This is somewhat reminiscent even of the way the Psalter begins. The Psalter begins in Psalm 1 with dissociation, separation. Listen to these words that begin the Psalter. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. That there is a, there is a, a sworn 
non-alliance, if I can say it that way, between righteousness and wicked, that we don't make peace with the wicked in their wickedness. David is, in fact, not doing anything here in this passage that isn't done several other places in the Psalms when he resolves himself on the Lord's side against the wicked. There's an interesting connection uh, that we should observe in verse, uh, in verse 20 uh, with verse, uh, with verse uh, 2 of our psalm. Back in verse 2, we read this, You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. Verse 20, though it can be somewhat lost in our English translations, it says, For they speak wickedly against, or they speak against you wickedly, and your enemies take your name in vain. Some earlier manuscripts say they rise up against you wickedly, or they rise themselves up against you wickedly. You can find that in a, in a marginal reading in the New American Standard. I think that there's something to this. God knows when you sit down and when you rise up, and He knows how you rise up. And He knows whether you rise up in gratitude to do His will, or whether you rise up to do your will and to serve idols. He knows when we sit down. He knows when we rise up. And David is considering the rising up of the wicked. And they rise up to tell lies and to shed blood. With those who rise up in that wicked way, he wants nothing to do. They speak wickedly. They speak against you wickedly, or they rise up wickedly against you and take your name in vain. He knows that their rebellious uprising will not escape the full knowledge of God. He also knows that God hates such rebellion. Therefore, he's formally dissociating himself. For those that rise up in wickedness, they are under the wrath of God. It is wise to remove yourselves from entanglements with those who are under his wrath. I don't say from involvement. We'll talk about this in a few moments. I don't say that we go out of the world. We are in the world as lights. We are near the unbelievers in terms of our our citizenship and our commerce, but we are not allies of them in their wickedness, and we withdraw ourselves from that. We might think of this in terms of the judgment that falls upon the house of Korah and his family in the passage from which we read earlier in Numbers 16. In number 16, there's a warning that comes to Moses and Aaron in which he warns through Moses and Aaron the people to withdraw themselves from Korah because they had rebelled against the Lord's anointed, rebelling against Moses and Aaron. The Lord prepares to destroy Korah and Dathan and Abiram, and he tells Moses to warn the people in these words, and they're the words we read earlier this evening. Depart now from the tents of these wicked men and touch nothing that belongs to them or you will be swept away in their sin. David looks at the wicked who, if they do not turn from their sin, will very, very much indeed be swept away in it. And he says, depart from me, you who rise up against God or speak wickedly against God, who take his name in vain. Charles Spurgeon says this, if God will not have you to live with him, I will not have you to live with me. That's how he summarizes the spirit of this. If God will not have you to live with him, I will not have you to live with me. We find this in a parallel passage a little earlier in the Psalter. Psalm 101, verses 6 and following. There, David says, My eyes shall be upon the faithful faithful of the land, and that, that they may dwell with me. He who walks in a blameless way is the one who will minister to me. Then he turns to consider others. He who practices deceit shall not dwell in my house. He who speaks falsehood shall not maintain his position before me. Every morning I will destroy all the wicked of the land, so as to cut off from the city of the Lord those who do iniquity. If the Lord will not have you to dwell with him, I will not have you to dwell with me. We must be careful, though, at this point that we not use this as covering for personal animosity or personal disagreements. By dissociating himself from the wicked, David is declaring his alignment with God, that he is for God. In so lining up with God, he must love what God loves and hate what God hates. In fact, his hatred here is not personal animus, 
His hatred here is really a Godward kind of hatred in which he's hating what God hates. And in fact, there's something that we need to consider that to love what God loves requires as its corollary that we hate what God hates. In fact, in our modern world in which we're told that love is the only thing we're allowed to do, sometimes maybe you don't see them in your neighborhood, we used to see them in the East Coast, the, the, the new secular creed, I believe, and one of the things they believe is, I believe love is love. I'm not even sure exactly what that means, but I'm supposed to love, 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 and hatred has become the only hateful thing in our society. To hate is evil, to love is always good. And yet here, the psalmist is saying, do not I hate them with the utmost hatred, exactly the thing that political correctness says we shouldn't do. We should always love, always affirm, always celebrate. In fact, we have a whole month now in which we are called nationally to celebrate iniquity. Love is the only option. Listen to these words, but certainly that's not David. Listen to these words from Proverbs 6, verses 16 to 19. There are six things which the Lord hates. Yes, seven which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, and feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. At least three items from this list show up explicitly in this little section of our psalm. Those that are, those that are proud, the haughty eyes, the hands that shed innocent blood, and the heart that devises wicked plans, these all more or less come out in this section of the psalm. When David says that he hates them, it's not from personal animus, but from his alliance with God. To love God requires that we hate what he hates. We're told in Psalm 7 that God has indignation every day. To love well means to hate well, which I submit is not an easy thing. To hate in a kind of emotional way that, is, that serves self and its interests is easy. You don't have to be taught how to do it. But you do have to be taught how to hate well, because it's actually the corollary of loving well, of loving what is good and what is lovely. We must keep this perspective in this, the perspective of the whole psalm. David's cause here is not himself, and it's not his desire to get even with enemies. His perspective and his cause are God's. William Plummer, in his commentary, sees here the principle that God's people must make common cause with him. His law is our law, his, his will or desire is our will, his friends are our friends, his enemies are our enemies. So we must ask, does this hatred spring from love of God, from attachment to holiness, or is it a selfish desire that is malicious and self-centered? Spurgeon says of David here, he was a good hater, for he hated only those who hated good. He was a good hater, for he, only, he hated only those who hated good. There is such a thing as good hatred. And in fact, there are things that ought to be hated that if you fail to hate them, you yourself are failing. There are things that are hateful, things that themselves are against the Lord and against His holiness. There is a sense in which this is a corresponding consideration when we think about love. You cannot love if you do not hate that which is opposed to what you love. God loves himself and God loves his glory, and he hates all those things that are allied against it. And David is saying that his heart is this way. He loves God's glory, which means he must hate that which is arrayed against it. It's also instructive to see that the hatred of David does not arise from a pity party that he's having. In fact, he doesn't even bother, in this case, to name uh, any of these wicked men of bloodshed. He, doesn't see, he hasn't been in the Psalms sitting around mulling over his enemies. Rather, he's been meditating on God and worshiping. And it's out of that worshipful frame of mind that these words proceed and that they are recorded. Worship cannot remain indifferent towards sin and toward those who hate God. Worship and indifference towards sin are diametrically opposed. And this is what I think makes this section of the psalm fit with what has gone before it. If he loves the Lord and if he loves his knowledge and his presence and his power, then it's a natural response that he hates all that which is arrayed against the Lord. 
Spurgeon, again, is very helpful here. The more we love God, he says, the more indignant we will grow with those who refuse him their affection. The more we love God, the more indignant we will grow with those who refuse him their affection. If you remember when David went to bring supplies to his brothers who were camped up on the edge of the valley of Elah, and the army of the Philistines were camped on the other side of the valley, and each day the giant Goliath came down into the valley and he cursed and ridiculed the God of the Israelites. And we're told in three different places that David was indignant and that David was incensed by the words of Goliath. Goliath didn't say anything about David, per se, a young shepherd boy. Goliath didn't give him a personal slight. Perhaps he did feel stung that he was insulting his nation, his people. But what really stung him was that Goliath was insulting his God. David's hatred is not due to a personal offense that he has received The hatred is due to an offense received against the name and the glory of his God. Also, we should observe this, that for all the hatred in David's heart, he does not take matters into his own hands. Again, the opening of this section, verse 19, Oh, that you, oh, that you would slay the wicked. That's his That's his prayer. He commends the judgment of the wicked to God. He doesn't take it into his own hands. He leaves to his Lord to order and to provide, even with respect to the judgment of the wicked. But that doesn't mean he doesn't pray for it. We pray that the Lord would smash and break every wicked thing that is allied against him. And we pray that he does it either in final judgment or that he does it by converting grace, but that all the strongholds would be taken down and that those who are arrayed against the Lord and his anointed would be laid low. We're told that he who sits in the heavens laughs at those who in futility uh, rage against him. I think that David's mind here is simply in agreement with that, that he commends the matter to the Lord. Again, he's showing that his will is in agreement with God's. In the giving of the Mosaic covenant, there are numerous blessings and curses An impudent blasphemer was supposed to die. Others could die for numerous other sins against God. So when David prays that God would slay the wicked, there's nothing unbiblical uh, in this way of thinking. In fact, the Old Testament frequently prescribes this. In fact, let's just be more clear on this. The reason there is death in the world is because of sin. God is slaying the wicked. That's what death is. The wages of sin is death. Death is the punishment that God has executed against wickedness. When David prays for the same thing, we shouldn't see this as an unbiblical kind of prayer. In fact, in addition to the Old Testament, you might think to yourself, well, that's the Old Testament. And the Old Testament's just so bloody. I just want to say, and not dive into it, just consider John's apocalypse. Just consider the book of Revelation, which in terms of carnage outpaces the Old Testament, um, by a great distance. Listen to Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 22. If anyone does not love the Lord, he is to be accursed. Maranatha. That's how he says it. If anyone does not love the Lord, he is to be accursed. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. And when he comes, he's going to come in judgment. Paul prays for that. In Luke 19, verse 27 Jesus depicts himself in the future when the kingdom is permanently and forever established. For all who repudiate him and ultimately resist him, he has these words. But for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. I know this is grim to think about this. But the wages of sin is death. And for those that persist in their sin and unbroken allegiance... For those that have aligned themselves together against the Lord and His anointed, for those that take His name in vain, for those that despise His worship and despise His glory, death is the only proper and right recompense for their sin. We might ask the question at this point, well, what about loving my enemies? He says here, I hate them with the utmost hatred. They have become my enemies. 
loving your enemy doesn't mean he's not your enemy. In fact, when we love our enemies, there's still a sense in which we don't love our enemies by calling them our friends if they remain in that state of sin and hostility. We can love those that currently are perishing in their sins, and we can pray for and seek their salvation, but that doesn't make them our friends. Insofar as they are on a course resolved against the Lord and against His anointed, they cannot in that condition be our friends in that relevant sense. I don't mean that we can't be friendly toward them, but we're friendly toward them as those that seek that they would forsake their sin and forsake unrighteousness and be reconciled to the Lord. I think the underlying point here is this, that we cannot have, we cannot align ourselves with God and love Him and remain indifferent toward the sin which opposes Him. And David is saying, if I'm going to love God, then I'm going to stand in opposition to all that which is against Him. To add one more point to this, Uh, And this I draw from E.J. Young. He points out that we pray the same thing in the Lord's Prayer as David does here. When we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, we're praying for a kingdom that will come and that will wipe out the kingdoms of this earth, that will sweep away into judgment all those that are currently seeking to build a kingdom in hostility to His. We pray, when we ask for His kingdom to come, we pray for the removal of all opposition. When His kingdom comes... It will be a judgmental affair in which many will be slain. Every time we pray, thy kingdom come, we're praying, oh, that you would slay the wicked, oh God. There's a real sense in which we don't want to, if I could put it this way, be be so sanitized that we cannot enter into the spirit of holy warfare exhibited both in the Old and the New Testament. Not that we have an individual malice, toward individuals. We seek now in the day of salvation their redemption and their reconciliation. What we don't do is love them in their sin. Rather, we, we love their souls seeking they would forsake their sin, not by giving approval to it. E.J. Young reminds us also that what we need to have is a pure hatred. Verse 22, I hate them, he says, with the utmost hatred. With the utmost hatred. He doesn't say, I kind of have some hateful feelings sometimes a little bit toward the wicked. I don't know, that, that sounds pretty weak. He says, I hate them with the utmost hatred. They have become my enemies. It must be with a wholehearted zeal for God. And we must be as wholehearted in our zeal for God as they are against him. You might think of a, this way of illustration, a boy who's given the responsibility to protect his younger brother, perhaps as a teenage boy, and he has to walk to school, and his parents say, look out for your brother, and maybe they meet a bully on the way, and the bully comes and starts pushing the little brother and getting rough with him, and it wouldn't do for the older brother to sort of stand on the sidelines, just sort of gently clearing his throat, throat) you know, could I suggest you stop? (laughs) May I suggest that you stop? In fact, if he's going, to, he's going to need to meet the zeal of the wicked with a zeal for righteousness that is equally intense, they are utmost in their hatred against the Lord. He must be utmost in his hatred, that he doesn't love them or he doesn't hate their wickedness with a kind of half-heartedness, but with a deep resolve, a hatred that is designed to match his love. If he loves God so deeply, then he must hate that which is hateful in an equally deep way. Young says, had David not hated, he would have desired the success of evil and the downfall of God himself. I think this is what Spurgeon's getting at when he talks about being a good hater. If, again, if we do not hate, then we desire the success of evil and the downfall of God. And by hate, I mean all that which is opposed to him and to his glory. Secondly, I told you it was a two-part sermon, so that for the first part, what to do with this, that to love God means to hate that which God hates and to align oneself with God against the forces of wickedness. Secondly, though, we consider that the Christian desires to be known by God, and this is perhaps an extension of that alliance. He, does, he isn't just simply aligning against the wicked, but he's aligning with God in which he desires and welcomes this perfect knowledge that God has of him. Instead of being 
repulsed by the doctrine of God's greatness instead of running from God's greatness or taking his stand with the kingdoms of this earth against God's greatness, David, in fact, is drawn near to the Lord. The principle here is that God is always concerned with us, verses 1 to 18, that we ought always to be concerned with him. That involves hating what he hates. This is true in verses 19 to 22. It's also true in these verses. This is what's striking in these verses, though. For all the hatred and the opposition that David has just expressed against the wicked, he is not so presumptuous as to think that there is no wickedness within his own breast, within his own heart. It's not just simply, I'm righteous, they're wicked. There's a deep sense that he himself is one of them, that he himself is one of the wicked. In fact, he speaks here of anxious thoughts, and in verse 24, of a hurtful way or a way of pain. All isn't right with those that are against the Lord, but he suspects that all may not be right in his own heart as well. As much as he hates opposition to God from the wicked mockers of God, he hates it just as much if not more, in his own heart. Thus, his attack on evil is not merely confined to those around him, but also to his own remaining sin. There's a real sense in which David is not just declaring war on the Lord's enemies outside of him, he's declaring war on the Lord's enemies, so to speak, inside of him. We're told in the New Testament, and the language is in fact very violent, that each day we are to put to death the deeds of the flesh, that we are to Mortify sin is an older word that we use, um, that, we are to put to, that we are to engage in spiritual warfare, and the enemy that we fight is not merely an enemy without, but the enemy that we fight is within. David hates everything outside of himself that is against God, and he hates everything inside of himself which is against God. His point is not simply, they are sinful, I am not. They are sinful, and so am I, and I hate their sin, and I hate my sin. That, sh- that marks him out as one who belongs to the Lord. His attack on evil is not simply external, but also internal. We also observe that he's not asking God to do something that God is not already doing. It's not that God is waiting to search his heart. It's not that God hasn't already made a careful um, judgment and assessment of him. If you remember from our first sermon uh, last Sunday morning, in verse 3, he says, you scrutinize my path and my lying down. We, we learn there that the word is winnow. You sift me. He knows your heart. He knows the dark parts of your heart and the parts of your heart that are allied with him. He knows, the, he knows your heart when you love his law, and he knows your heart when you are sold to lawlessness. God isn't waiting, as it were, to make a thorough examination of you. His eyelids test the sons of men, and he doesn't wait for men to invite him to do it. And yet, the way you read these last two verses, it almost sounds as if David is inviting the Lord. But we shouldn't read this invitation as inviting the Lord to do what the Lord is not already doing. It it should read something more like a consecration to the Lord and a joyful welcome of the Lord's scrutiny. This is something more like an amen. You have searched me and have known, verse 1. Verse 23 and 24, so let it be. In other words, what he's showing is that the disposition of his heart welcomes the scrutiny of his God. Those wicked that he's described in verses 19 to 22 are not like this. They do not welcome the examination of the Lord. They can't resist it. They can't fool him. They can't deceive him. They can't escape him. But oh, how they wish they could. David has sins not dissimilar to theirs. David, yes, David was a man of bloodshed in the, in the good and righteous sense in that he fought wars against the wicked under God's design and commission. But David was also a wicked man of bloodshed as well. David arranged for the murder of his friend and servant and near neighbor Uriah the Hittite. You remember this very well, all in an act to hide his own, adul- his own act of adultery. David shed blood, and David ran toward evil, and David plotted wickedness in his own heart. David doesn't find an enemy outside there that he doesn't find inside of himself. 
And yet the Lord searches and the Lord knows and the Lord sifts and the Lord divides and the Lord judges the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. The believer does not say, go ahead and take a look, I have nothing to hide. The believer says, I'm full of dead man's bones and rottenness. Search me, see me, try me, heal me, restore me, regenerate me, make me new. That's the spirit of David. He's not asking God to do something new. He's simply affirming in his spirit that he's glad that God is the one who knows him perfectly, who's able to keep him and to lead him. This is really evidence of his consecration to God. In verse 1, he began, O Lord, you have searched me and known. I know that Nasby adds known me, but it's, it's actually just open-ended. You have searched me and known. But here he, he specifies it more explicitly. Search me, O God, and know. And he doesn't say, search me, O God, and know. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. We talked about this this morning, that God has knit us together in the inward parts, our kidneys, the inner man of the heart is made by God. Search me and know that part of me that only you can so perfectly know. He's asking the Lord to keep a close watch over his heart. Proverbs 4 says that we are to keep a close watch over our hearts, but we're never to do it apart from the Lord. David, David examines himself. We can see that most especially perhaps in his penitential psalm in Psalm 51. But he asks more importantly for God to examine him because while you examine your own heart and while you keep watch over your own heart, you are not an infallible watcher of your heart. You can be, you can be clouded in your self-judgment. We tend to be easier on ourselves. You know, we sometimes say, don't be so hard on yourself. I find that in fact, probably... Well, that may be an occasional problem. More often the problem should be something like, don't be so easy on yourself. <laughs> you know how this works? When you contemplate things in your mind, you always come out as the one who's in the right, who hasn't done wrong. The conversations in my head, I always make the best points. <laughs> how deluded we can be. How, how estranged we can be to ourselves. David isn't going to leave it to himself to do the assessing of his heart. While well, he certainly will undertake to search his heart and to keep it, he knows that he cannot keep his own heart ultimately, and he commends, as it were, his heart to the Lord. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, he says, and know, and know my anxious thoughts. Those would be thoughts where he doesn't trust the Lord. Be anxious for nothing. <laughs> But with everything, with thanksgiving, make your petitions known to the Lord. And yet, anxiety is, a, anxiety is a form of lack of trust. Anxiety, while we can be concerned, and there's a proper concern, anxiety takes us to a level of not trusting the Lord. But why not trust the Lord? He's the one who sees when you sit down, when you rise up. He understands your thought from afar. He knows a word before it's in your mouth. He's the one who's in heaven. If you make your bed in the grave, he's there too. If you fly to the far ends of the earth or the bottom of the sea and the, at the speed of light, behold, he is there. His right hand leads you. The darkness which might overwhelm you doesn't overwhelm him. Night and dark, night and day are alike to him. Um, why not trust him? Why not trust him? Anxiety withdraws trust from God. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. See all those areas in which I am not fully trusting you. And then he says, and see if there be any hurtful way in me, is how the New American Standard translates it. Literally, way of pain. The word is sometimes used to denote idolatry. The sense is of a, of a twistedness against the Lord? Will the Lord find a shape in my heart that is bent away from Him? The hurtful way or the way of pain is a way that bends itself toward other gods, toward false refuges. Final lines of the psalm are really striking. See if there be any hurtful way in me or way of pain, the last line, and lead me, lead me in the everlasting way. David is glad to be exposed before the Lord, not because he has nothing to hide, but because he has things to hide and only the Lord can deal with them. He has an attitude fully expect, and this is, he comes to the Lord and he doesn't come with a sense that the Lord is going to cut him off. He comes to the Lord with hopeful expectation. He brings his faults, 
He brings his sins. He brings the darkness of his heart. He lays himself, as it were, before the Lord and says, have at me, not thinking the Lord won't find iniquity, but that finding iniquity, the Lord and he himself can deal with it. You might know that you're sick. You might feel it, but not really understand it, that you are desperately ill. And you go to a physician and you say, Doc, put me under the MRI, put me under the x-ray, take all the tests, <laughs> take my blood, take samples, do whatever you have to do, probe me, search me, don't hold back, Doc. Tell me what you find. Cure me. <laughs> Heal me. That's how he's going to the Lord. He's not going to the Lord with presumption and pride. He's going to the Lord as a desperate and wicked sinner, the way that each of us comes to the Lord, because only God can save him. This infinite knowledge, presence, and power of God should not drive us from God, but rather compel us toward him as the only one able to sufficiently deal with our sin. And then he ends on this note when he says, and lead me in the way everlasting. He's seeking the Lord to cure him, but not, not for a while. Not for, you know, the doctor might deal with your illness and say, you're going to be good for 10 years. The Lord deals with your illness, with your sin sickness. And when he divides you and sifts you and searches you and knows you, and when he heals you, he doesn't give you a cure that will last for a little while. He doesn't even give you a cure that will last for a lifetime. He gives you a cure that will last for a lifetime and then for one after that, in fact, one that will never end. And lead me, he says, in the everlasting way. I don't say that to my physician. If I'm sick, I say, Doc, what are the prospects of getting better and how long can I expect to feel better? And he never says, forever. Well, without malpractice. God says, forever forever. If we come to him in faith, lay ourselves before him, humble ourselves before him, not like the enemies of verses 19 to 22, but like the sinner of verses 23 to 24. If we lay ourselves before him, humbled in his presence, he does heal us. Jesus says in Psalm John 17, this is eternal life, that they may know you and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Christ came to do this for us. Christ came to heal us, to carry our diseases and to take our iniquities away from us, to to heal those anxious thoughts and those hurtful ways, to restore us to spiritual health and vitality, to life and light in the very presence of God himself. He does this through his death, dying unto sin. He does this through his resurrection, living unto God in newness of life. And if you trust him in his death and resurrection, his death and resurrection is the ointment that heals all our diseases. Psalm 16, verse 11, somewhat parallels this in its final verse. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence, I want to even say, where Christ is seated at the right hand of glory. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forever. Let's go to our Lord in prayer.